So I want to start by thanking the organizers for uh, giving this great opportunity to be here. And, um, and of course, my talk wouldn't be here uh, if uh, I did not have these fantastic collaborators. We started this work with my former postdoc, Vlad Belli. And today, I'm going to focus on most recent work with Bo Peng and Hamid Shoshiye. OK, so uh, I don't have to show the next slide uh, uh, for this audience. But nevertheless, maybe there are a couple of people in here uh, for whom I want to emphasize the fact that you know, when you take a capsid, uh, inside we have the genome, which is negatively charged due to the phosphate groups. And the encapsulating capsid is uh, multiple copies of the same similar, similar kind of protein. And they usually carry positive charges. And that's, one, that's the reason why we have this uh, title electrostatics. And of course, broadly speaking, there are uh, uh, two kinds of shapes. One is uh, the icosahedral shape, like uh, this is a tobacco mosaicovirus, satellite tobacco mosaicovirus. And we had this character already today, earlier today. This is TMB. This is more helical. And then you can have composite. This is a phage. And the genome could be single-stranded RNA, single-stranded DNA, single uh, double-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA. And uh, today, I'm going to uh, focus my attention on uh, these uh, icosahedral viruses with a single stranded RNA. Right? And that's the place where electrostatics plays a role. And this beast is an entirely different universality class where electrostatics is not that important to my mind. OK, so where do I start? Uh, I get into trouble right away. OK, so this is a yeah, typical protein uh, uh, which is constituting the capsid. And uh, you know, somebody who plays with paper and pencil uh, this is a total, total intimidating mess. And I see the alpha helices, the beta sheets. Of course, I took a lot of courses in biochemistry and biophysics. But nevertheless, this is very intimidating. Uh, there is a hairpin in here. Uh, and, and I look at another character. It's extremely scary to me. OK, uh, maybe I want to do something. Um, maybe not to deal with this at all. The second thing is uh, the partner. If you take RNA and you take any of these uh, genomes, and this RNA structure, we'll see some discussions about it more uh, in the rest of the conference. Each one is a high, highly branched structure, and it's a negatively charged. It's a highly branched structure. And of course, all these uh, attributes are contributing the uh, size and shape of this RNA and how that's going to interact with the capsule. OK, this is my problem. How am I going to deal with this? Um, and then in one afternoon, uh, we had a lucky break. Uh, just uh, putting our feet up on the chair, you know, just in front of a blackboard, we were looking at it. Uh, we looked at uh, several uh, viruses, RNA viruses. And the amount of RNA packaged was different. The number of vertices could be the same. Um, you know, you can have a variety of them. And what we observed was, generically speaking, the typical motif of the building block. This every uh, protein molecule had this building block. There is a hydrophobic domain, and there is a tail which carried dominantly a positive charge, which is protruding into the lumen of the virus. And of course, this, vi this virus is floating around water, you know, aqueous solution with salty conditions. And, and the outside is also charged. And there is also another domain in here, which is also charged, which is going to be exposed to the exterior world. So this was a typical motif. Then we thought we'll just do a paper and pencil calculation in about 30 minutes, right? That was the goal, right? And you are not going to believe me when I say it's only 30 minutes calculation, but uh, people, experts in here know how this is done. OK, let's imagine, just for fun, let's imagine the problem is like this. I have a spherical vessel, and then I have a bristles, a charged bristles uh, protruding into the room. And then I have my RNA, which is a flexible polyelectrolyte, which is going to be RNA, single cell RNA is flexible, and that's going to be inside this lumen. Let me just do this, all right? And how would I do this? I want to start with a Hamiltonian. Right. So well, how, uh, yes, I don't have an internet here. That's OK. But uh, I don't see it on my screen. How do I get rid of that? Uh, let me see. I don't see it in here. Sorry? Yeah, I'm not that co well coordinated with my mouse. <laughs> but I can tell you, right? Bas yeah. oh, please. All right, so basically, right, so that is uh, the cationic uh, protein brush. <laughs> See, it is, it is not there. 
No, we'll go, go back. Please go back. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so this is very unique, uh, right? It's okay, no problem, you can still read it, right? It's not important, you can't read it anyway, right? So here, the blue is RNA, so it has uh, all the confirmations of this RNA, single strand RNA is in this blue color, and the bristles are the protein tails, and then the, the hydrophobic domain is, is somewhere there, and the red color corresponds to all the confirmations of these uh, protein tails, and then everything else is electrostatics. There is interaction between blue and blue, there is interaction between red and red, interaction between blue and red, and there is lots of salt in here, there is also interaction from the salt. So the electrostatics coming, coming from RNA, capsule proteins, and the salt. Right. And then what do you do? That's a partition sum. You calculate the free energy, minimize the free energy, and get to the optimum confirmation. This is something you can do analytically. In spite of all the complicated equations I'm showing you, it is doable analytically. And the answer is, as some of you already know, is the following. It makes very simple uh, predictions. Prediction number one is that if I look at the, this is a very key equation that I must wait for this gentleman. Yeah. I hope you'll give me extra two minutes. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> we had sorted that out. That's fine. Sorry. Not at all. No problem. Because the first equation is a very key equation, which comes out uh, in a very simple-minded way. But you have to do the work. You have to do the analytical work. If you do it, the answer is the amount of DNA, single strand RNA, sorry, which is a packaged number of repeat units that is packaged into this virus is simply proportional to total positive charge carried by all these bristles. That's a simple prediction. This is not a, a novel uh, idea. If you take any atom in the periodic table, we believe in electron neutrality. You know, you, when you put one extra electron, that's not as stable as the neutral case. Right. No problem. Don't worry. See, this is my life. Don't look at it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, perfectly. All right. So, so that's the prediction, right? So this uh, total length of RNA that is packaged is proportional to total positive charge carried by all these um, uh, tails. The second prediction is the density profile of this uh, polynucleotide away from the wall will have this uh, depletion zone. It will kick up like z square, reaches the maximum, come, come off. I did not say anything about the sequence. You know, I did not say anything about packaging signal in here. Because in my Hamiltonian, it's very difficult to put in the sequence to do it uh, in the way, in the style with which we do analytical calculations. Then I have to resort to computer, and then I have to do all the all the things which we have done separately later on. Okay, so that these are the predictions, and these predictions have turned out to be good. Uh, surprisingly, with the, given this approximation, simple calculations, these are the data. These are not uh, simulations. These are Mother Nature's data over billions of years. For all kinds of viruses, they fall on this very nice muscle curve, exactly the way we predicted. Named the lambda is proportional to total charge. And similarly, if you look at uh, the density profile, we heard references to uh, Jack Johnson, right? From his laboratory, you know, they changed the sequences, and the virus assembly is the same. And uh, you know the, the whole process takes place independent of the sequence. And they said the genetic content is, content is different, and uh, you know the, uh, the the diversity of RNA transcripts, but they all package following electron neutrality. Okay, now uh, so what? This has been a good suggestion because now you can package a DNA with anything that is possibly charged. It doesn't have to be a capsid proteins. All right, you can, for gene therapy, you would you know, take DNA, package it. Or play uh, Bogdan's again, you know, put cargo inside the capsule proteins. It doesn't have to be an RNA. It can be anything that is negatively charged. As long as it follows the electron neutrality rule, you can package as much as you want. Right? And philosophically, the, uh, the uh, message is that the virus is assembled in a way that the total charges have to be balanced and meant it probably in the early stages of evolution, it was a co-evolution. It's not only central dogma, that is only RNA dictating everything, but also they were going back and forth. Uh, and that's what uh, the implication is. Now let's look at the kinetics of assembly. Now the situation is slightly different. 
let's just go to the basic physical chemistry uh, argument. Suppose I have a plaquette of a, some size linear size or two-dimensional plaquette, and then you can compose the free energy of formation of uh, this nucleus, and that will have a nucleation barrier, uh, and that is a line tension, that is a bulk gain in free energy, and then, you know, and based upon this, you can talk, you can think about nucleation time going like e to the one over uh, super uh, saturation or super cooling, depending upon which variable you use. And then once that is born, it will grow by various entropic and energetic um, uh, encounters of the various, uh, you know, individual components at the perimeter, and it will grow, and then eventually it will close. And then based upon conventional arguments of nucleation, classical nucleation theory, one could make a prediction that the growth rate would also be e to the minus 1 over t or minus t. Similar formulas, but the prefactors would be different. This is, again, a very simple argument one could make. And then you do simulations, right? What we did was we did Langevin dynamic simulations. I must uh, make it very clear here. We use the fluctuation dissipation theorem and the friction coefficient of an entity is appropriate to that fluctuation dissipation theorem. Right, so we do Langevin dynamics properly, in view of the comment that we heard before. Okay, when you do this, what we what we what we showed was uh, there is a very narrow range of a temperature and a protein concentration when this assembly will take place, and uh, we were absolutely very grateful to this uh, uh, Spanish team. Who, we do not know who they are, but they did a fantastic site director uh, site, um, mutagenesis work. They did a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, experiments, and then they came up with the minimum structure that you need in order for this virus to take place. So we piggybacked on their work, and, uh, and the reference is given in our work, and we could show how this happens. We could follow the kinetics, uh, what the, uh, the kinetic, how the kinetics is taking place. To make a long story short in here, it also it involves a nucleation barrier. So in the absence of the RNA, Capsid proteins alone could assemble if the conditions are right. There's a barrier in here. That barrier is substantially reduced in the presence of uh, RNA. And um, also, the amount that the barrier is reduced depends upon the RNA sequence. Uh, right. The RNA sequence contributes to the kinetics of the assembly, but not to the final structure. Okay, that's basically the summary. And sometimes when the virus particle without the uh, genome, it may not be able to assemble, but the RNA would allow you to assemble. And therefore, uh, and, and in fact, what happens is uh, this tell us, an analysis of these data tell us that we could use the classical nucleation growth theory for understanding this assembly of these viruses. And in fact, in order to check this, I'm going to be very quick in here, the prediction, this was a classical argument, right? Uh, the time for nucleation will go, ha lo go like this, and that's the law that we saw. And on, on similarly, the growth rate should, is predicted to be that, that way, and that's exactly what we saw. Whether we look at the nucleation rate or the growth rate, that the melting temperature or dissolution temperature is the same, and it has to be. Okay, so this, this verifies theoretically that nucleation growth mechanism is operative for the growth kinetics of a virus. Yes, Robin? Right, not in our case. We can, we can discuss this, not in our case. We calculated the nuclear, right. not in our case. Right, but it's a matter of definition of how you calculate your line tension and also bulk energy, right? It depends upon that, right? Right. Okay, we can, we can pick. Robbie, we can talk about this later. Robin, can we talk about this later? Yeah, because I'm just showing simulation data and the analysis, they fit perfectly fine. Right. We can quibble about the magnitude, we can, but it's not at all, I'll show you, the, it's not at all 100 kT. So we are talking about 6 kT, right? And I'll come back to this energy later on. You know, incidentally, the ATP hydrolysis, for some of the people who are not familiar, ATP hydrolysis is 20 kT, right? And I'm talking about 6 kT, 6 kT to 10 kT. Oh, 
Okay, so in, in uh, these simulations here, oh sorry, here we took MEM, minute virus, uh, mice minute virus, I think it's called, right? And that's, uh, that's the one they had the external uh, data. So we, uh, we wanted to piggyback on them. We took that virus, we take that as a typical example where there were data. So that's what we analyzed. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is a global point. It is not the particular example that I want to talk about. I'm talking about a global point. That is, nucleation growth mechanism is a good platform to think about the kinetics of virus assembly. OK, so let me show you this. This is from uh, our friends, right? I, I think we saw this uh, graph already. Uh, yes, of course, the experimentally, the very beautiful fluorescence correlation uh, spectroscopy experiments clearly show that it was really a two-stage mechanism. And you can go back and uh, look at all the arguments and look at the data. They match extremely well with the simulation data. And also this uh, most, most recent work. OK, so what do I want to conclude? This is a conclusion for Robin. OK, the conclusion is, I'm not done yet. This is only the first part, right? Um, in general, uh, electrostatics dominates single-stranded RNA virus assembly, not double-stranded DNA. It's, you know, it controls single-stranded RNA virus assembly. And the spirit of my argument is captured in the model of the very first book on virology. This is by Luria, 1953 book. I must read it loud, particularly for the younger people in here. There is an intrinsic simplicity of nature, and the ultimate contribution of science resides in the, theory, in the discovery of unifying, simplifying generalizations rather than in the description of isolated situations, Robin, in the visualization of simple overall patterns. OK, what do we want to share with you next? I want to know what the fate of this is, this virus is. OK, I made this virus. This is what happens. Now, how does it get demolished? We had a beautiful lecture before. I want to see, I want to understand how to break up this virus. All right. So there are lots of versions. Uh, let me just simply go in here. There, is, there are two ways it can happen. Right? One is the complete dissolves, uncomplexation between the polyanion and polycation. And the other one is it slithers through. Well, lots of holes are on the, on the surface of this virus. It slithers and it undergoes a translocation and goes out. Okay? And of course, they will recombine and then do proliferation of the viruses, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the question that I want to understand. And how do I want to understand? This is something that is like a child's game. Uh, some of you might laugh at me um, for being so, uh, so simple-minded. And I went about three ways. The first way is, OK, let me take this uh, virus using this electrostatic principle. I have some amount of RNA in here. And let me arbitrarily consider, suppose I increase the amount of RNA, length of the RNA, arbitrarily. Let me say there is going to be an excess. That excess is given by n minus q. q is a total positive charge on the protein. And N is a total negative charge on the RNA. And this V is the volume of my capsid uh, of the virus. So theta is my order parameter. So what I want to know is, what is the free energy of this virus as a function of theta? How does that happen? When is it going to be not stable? How much price I have to pay to package more and more of my RNA into the virus? The second thing that I want to do is, OK, so let me take a complex of a positively charged uh, polymer and negatively charged polymer. And they are complex. And I want to break it up. How do I break it up? I bring an invader. I bring a competitor, and I see whether that is going to pry this blue out of this red, and I make a partner with the red. And what is, what is the force involved? How do I think about it? And what are the energetics involved? What are the appropriate conditions? The other strategy is to look at a translocation to the exterior. Because I, we already, I already told you the virus outside of the virus is also polar, because it has to be water friendly. So inside, it is going to be captured here. And then I want to put it out. And how does that happen? What are the energetics involved in order to decompose this? So now the question uh, is I want you to ponder over the following question. Suppose I have a virus like this, and I have a bristle. OK, that's my starting point. And, I don't, and then I put uh, my, uh, my DNA my DNA, RNA, sorry, it's not red enough, my RNA. And arbitrarily make it a lo little longer, negatively charged. But then there are also, as we talked about, there are lots of proteins in here, lots of enzymes in here. Let me put some enzyme here. 
some enzymes here. And of course, there is salt, plus, minus, plus, minus, and outside plus, minus, plus, minus. So you're no longer about simple RNA virus, but there are no proteins. Right. Let's take general, because I can always put the concentration of this added protein to be zero in my general problem. That's the easy limit. All right. So let's think about this. How would we do this? Now, so uh, the, right, there, are, there are conformational fluctuations of the tails, the, pro, uh, the uh, RNA, and also these proteins that I'm adding. And I, but the most important, it turns out, is the small ions, which are mobile, they create osmotic pressure. The translational entropy of these small ions is uh, dominating much more than the conformational contributions to the free energy. It turns out if you do the calculations. Right. But now I have to make sure that I keep the down in equilibrium, namely the chemical potential of the salt inside is the same as the chemical potential outside. I have to make that condition. Otherwise, I'm not doing it right. Okay. So let's do this calculation. Something remarkable happens. Okay. If you do the calculation, uh, what I find is the following. This is the free energy density as a function of theta, that I excess the genome that I'm putting in. The global free energy minimum corresponds to that number. That's about 0.2. That value of theta is being 0.2, 0.21, something like this. Right. And then, I, this is for a particular salt concentration. Right. Now I add the salt concentration, increase the salt concentration. When you increase salt concentration, that minimum turns out to be a little bit lower, but still that's a global free energy minimum. Then when I go to about 0.25 molar monovalent salt, then that minimum goes away. It undergoes a phase transition. It is not a stable global free energy minimum anymore. It really becomes a now. This line is no genome at all. So it becomes unstable. The system becomes unstable. So when I add more and more salt, I, the virus doesn't like to have the genome inside. A very simple calculation, but it's a kind of indicative of the stability of the system. Then you can calculate the susceptibility, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so that's the conclusion number one. Now let me go to the second case, uh, namely uncomplexation. Yeah. Sorry, when you say that the virus doesn't like it, it means that it doesn't assemble, or it means that the assembly is not unstable? Uh, I think it's unstable. It becomes unstable. Unstable means that the the encapsulated RNA inside the virus is unstable state. Yeah, we, we have data showing that you can put more RNA than its natural package and it creates salt a lot, and nothing happens. Well, I'd love to see that. OK, I, I would love to see those data, please, yeah. But uh, I, already I was kind of worried that 0.25 molar is very high, right? But my uh, biology friends told me that that's OK. There is lots of changes in the inside of the cell. Right, uh, but 0 0.6, molar, no? 0.6 molar. Okay, that's very interesting. Please wait for a couple of more. Yeah, that would that would be very interesting. Please wait for a couple of more slides. Right, uh, it, it may be related to a comment that you are making. But this is inside the virus. I'm talking about this is inside the virus. Okay, so now let me go to uh, the second question. Suppose I have a complex, right, um, and I want to uncomplex this. So let's think about this for a second. We all know that when you have two charges, we know the force between them. That is Coulomb. That is 1 over R squared. And we know that in an electrolyte solution, the, the force between two charges is given by de Foucault approximately, or Poisson Boltzmann. It's, it's going to look like this. It turns out what would be the force between the two topologically correlated charged entities? One is a polycation and polyanion. None of those, obviously. Right? Cannot be, because the topological correlations contributes. And then we compute them. We calculate them. Analytically, we can calculate from the free energy and also compute them to verify our approximations of a reasonable one. Then I make this complex. Then what I do is, as I'm repeating myself, bring an invader, and that invader is going to kick this blue out and then make, uh, make the new pair. And I want to know what the substitution time is. Because that substitution time is critical for me to understand how, when, how I'm going to break up my virus inside the cell if this mechanism were to be operated. OK, so let me show you uh, one movie. Here. Here is a, first of all, this is a complexation. So we, in this complexation, 
uh, right? The counter ions are adsorbing on the backbone of the chain here, green counter ions, and then here is white counter ions there. And when they are mating, the counter ions are being released. And I used to think the electrostatic attraction is a dominant one in dictating the process. It turns out the release of counter ions is actually dominating in the complexation mechanism because they are gaining a lot of entropy. The release counter ions are you know, experiencing a lot of translational entropy, and that is creating the complex. OK, now I have made this complex. Then what I do is I break it. Break it means I bring an invader. And the blue and red is a complex, and now green is the invader. Please look at this. Lots, lots of counter ions are on the green, and that's a pair. And the pair is struggling to remain as a pair because this is a bigger one, deliberately brought a bigger one, right? Uh, playing around. And here also the counter ions are condensing there. It turns out, eventually the breakup will take place. It turns out the dominant force responsible for the substitution is counter ion release only in that domain where the attack is taking place. However much charge you bring, it doesn't matter at all. Only uh, at the place where the new chain is attacking, how much counter ion, uh, ions that are released, that's the one that is contributing. So based upon these simulations, we looked at the time needed for substitution. And of course, when the ratio of the new chain, length of the new chain versus the, whole, the previous chain is one, it's infinity. The substitution will not take place at all, it turns out. And then eventually it goes down to this 30, 30 length, this 60, 60 length. And when the ratio is about 50% larger, 1.5 of the length of the new chain to the earlier chain, uh, then beyond that, there is no gain in bringing a longer chain. There's no gain at all. So all that you have to do, you know, if you want to break up this complex, you need to bring a chain which is about 50% uh, you know, longer. Doing more than that is not necessary. Now, what is the driving force for this? Again, as I was repeating myself, this is entropy, release of counter ions. That's the one. Electrostatic is not playing a, that important role in this substitution process, release of counter ions. Then we thought, OK, instead of this, why don't you just challenge this complex with a salt? Because we thought it will loosen up. That's related to your earlier question. Suppose, you know, uh, then what we did was, here is a simulation. It is a, you know, there are lots of salt ions from moving around. And we challenged it with a 0.5 molar sodium chloride type salt. Then it breaks apart not 0.25 molar that came with the analytical calculation, but the simulation 0.5 was good enough for short chains. We are talking about only 30 monomer chains. For that, 0 0.4, if you did 0.4 molar, it would not break apart. We have to go to very high salt here okay, for this mechanism. OK, so now let me go to the third one. Uh, how do I bring the polymer from the interior to the exterior? So here is the problem. Here I go back to uh, theory. So what we do is, um, let me start with the inside. There's a charge density of the polymer, which is Q. Charge density on the surface with the sigma. Salt concentration inside and outside is the same. And R, because you know, I want to make sure the dynamic equilibrium is all OK. And the R is the radius of this, uh, this vesicular sphere. And then I want to take this to the outside. I want to calculate the free energy difference. The way we do, as, as the experts in the, in the audience know, is you know, write it as a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Vp is all the potentials coming from uh, the polymer, 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 polymer in here. And Vs is between the polymer and the, and the surface. And then for this particular problem, Vs, the potential from the surface, is written as a device huckle. And uh, you know, depending upon whether the exterior problem or interior problem, it's all standard textbook material. And V0 is an important quantity here. It, various parameters come into a one combined quantity. Sigma is the charge density on the surface. Q is the charge density on the polymer. This is the persistent length of the polymer. Kappa is the inverse Debye length, depending on salt concentration. And the LB is the Beerum length. For water, it's about 0.7 nanometers. Right. So that is uh, the setup of the problem. Then what we do is uh, you convert this, after massaging these various variables, convert it into this uh, time-independent Schrodinger equation. And the Rx, the potential, the effective potential is like this. And then here, when you solve for the eigenvalue problem, then you can calculate the entropy contribution to the free energy. And then this is the enthalpy contribution to the free energy. But the key variable here is this combined parameter. This is my interaction parameter, sigma, q, divide length, 
and then did the chain swelling, which is, uh, you know, because when you change the salt, the polymer chain will change its conformation, and that's the BRM length. Okay, so let me show the results. There are lots of puzzling results. I just want to share as a challenge. We have not faded out in terms of analytical work, but the numerical simulations are very good. So the potential inside and outside, of course, has to be continu continuous. Uh, that's the way it is. And then uh, the effective potential uh, has a turning point. Uh, people who work with the quantum mechanics will know this. This is really a, really a painful exercise, right? There's the inside, outside, in, inside, you know, there is region one, region two. We use a WKB. Um, it's technically challenging. That's what we had to do. We did that. So inside, what we uh, found was this parameter, 24 times pi times sigma critical charge density Q uh, BRM length as a function of uh, inverse divide length in units of the persistent length, monomer length. There is a universal law that we get. If this number, this quantity is higher than this curve, if it's above this curve, we will have complexation. And remarkably, that condition depends upon kappa as a 5 half power law. In the outside, asymptotically, the exponent turns to 11 over 5. Again, above these curves for different sizes of these viruses, we'll have adsorption. And below that, there will not be any adsorption. Okay. Then there is one more remarkable thing that comes out of these calculations, which is if you consider the RNA inside, flexible polyelectric inside, there is a spontaneous selection of a virus size. This came as a big surprise to us. And that spontaneous size, kappa times that radius of this virus, depends on the interaction parameter B as a power law, two-third power law, roughly two-third power law. Uh, there must be an elegant analytical derivation, which I don't have yet. And uh, we can trace the origin of this behavior, why there is a spontaneous selection, et cetera, et cetera, but there is a spontaneous selection. And now let's look at taking the polymer from inside to outside. Again, we were very surprised. There could be a kubel there. Uh, the change in free energy to take the RNA from inside to outside for identical conditions is only about few kT. And of course, that depends upon soil concentration, but it's really modest driving force for expulsion. This is, uh, this is fantastic news. When you think about it philosophically, this is really fantastic. That's why it happens so easily, right? But this is what this calculation tells me, right? And uh, it's really very small. That doesn't mean that there is no barrier between the initial and final state. In order for it to go through, it has to go through an entropic barrier. This is another life of me where you know, I, I have been thinking about a polymer translocation. Christian knows that, right? I have been doing this. So the way the uh, RNA is going to go through this um, uh, capsid wall from interior to exterior, there are lots of free energy landscapes. You can write focal plant description, da 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 da. And that's uh, pretty much under control in my domain. Uh, and there is a barrier. That barrier is about 6 kT. Okay? It's not humongous. That's about 6 kT for these kind of polymers. So with these arguments, then let me conclude by saying that, uh, okay, so regarding uh, the fluctuations in the genome size, uh, Don and equilibrium tells me that there is a phase transition in genome size. Okay? There is, you know, beyond certain amount of uh, genome, according to this argument, uh, you know, it is not stable. And uncomplexation by competitor, substitution uh, driven by counter and release, and the threshold length for effective substitution is really finite, very small. And I believe this uncomplexation is probably taking place in the cellular environment by salt gradient, not by bringing a competitor. I thought there was going to be some competitor which is going to break it, but I do not know. But I think, I think that seems to be possible. Okay. And finally, in terms of translocation and exterior, the criteria for adsorption on the interior and exterior can be very easily derived. Only a few kT as a driving force for expulsion. I think uh, I'm pretty much done. Once more, I love this quote from Luria. I must just say that again, and I'm very grateful to my students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm here now. Kill me.